Hey guys, I think it's important that we pray for those who make themselves available for leadership. Billy Graham made a statement one time. He said, a coach will touch more people in a year than most men will in a lifetime. That's true of other leaders too. They coach. We need leadership in this state. But we need a state that's engaged in selecting the leadership. Can I get a better amen? We do that through engagement. We do that through bringing the light. We do that through personal relationship. Covenant people communicate and cooperate. And we are called covenant people. And I'm honored to introduce some additional covenant people to you tonight. We have two special guests from Mississippi that are probably here at the single-handed efforts of two of Louisiana's finest, our Attorney General Jeff Landry and our Solicitor General Liz Merle. And I'm going to let them introduce our two guests. Jeff? You know, when we think about where we are today, I mean, just let it soak in. Because I knew I grew up in a pro-life family. That was something that my mother consistently preached and taught us in our family. That if you didn't have a respect for life, you couldn't have a respect for anything else. And it's amazing because Louisiana, along with Mississippi, has consistently led in probably the thing that matters the most in this country. And that is life. And Gene, you all have for many, many years on this stage given these legislators these awards for standing up for life. And then we had to go out there and we had to defend those laws. Oh, y'all kept us real busy. But I think, it is, I think it is prophetic. When you think about the two cases that went back to back and the women who led those cases, Think about that. Think about, I always say, my mommy said, you know, the good Lord has a sense of humor. And when we think about the opposition, those that have no respect for life, those that would rather murder children and to be responsible for their particular actions, and how they used women as the reason to hide behind their evil. And yet tonight, tonight we have an opportunity to hear from a woman, a unbelievable woman, a woman who was chosen by Time Life magazine as one of the most 100 influential women in the world. And so tonight it is. It is my deepest honor to introduce you all to the woman and the gentleman. And of course, that would be Liz's job. And we didn't set it up like this. The Lord did to the woman who led us to that victory. Because Rick is right. Tonight we celebrate. We celebrate life because of this great woman who led the charge on the shoulders, as she stood on the shoulders of each one of you all who marched in D.C. year after year, who got on your knees and prayed, who had an absolute respect for life. So tonight... It is my honor to introduce you all to Attorney General Lynn Fitch from Mississippi. And it's my honor to be able to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Scott Stewart. And I want to tell you, Scott is my counterpart. He's the Solicitor General in Mississippi. And he was appointed in 2021 by Lynn Fitch to take over the job of Solicitor General. And the first thing that he encountered in his job as Solicitor General was taking on the Dobbs case um, when cert was granted at the United States Supreme Court. And just a few years ago, we stood at the center of that storm and all of you prayed, you prayed for the change that, that, that Mississippi has been able to accomplish for the country. You prayed for me and for Jeff, and, and we spent hundreds of hours preparing for that fight and preparing to stand at the United States Supreme Court. And I know that Scott did the same thing. And, and Scott's preparation to, to, to encounter this fight and to handle this fight started 
much longer before that, he went to Princeton undergrad, he went to Stanford Law School, he clerked in the Ninth Circuit, he clerked for Justice Thomas on the Supreme Court, he worked at the Department of Justice and he's argued over 40 cases in the courts of appeal. He argued the case in, um, a few years ago, you might have remembered when a minor crossed uh, the border illegally and claimed a constitutional right to obtain an abortion in the United States. And he argued that case too. So he's been preparing for this fight. I don't think we ever really can completely prepare for this fight. We can't, it's very, very difficult to prepare yourself to argue this kind of case at the United States Supreme Court because you are at the middle of such a firestorm and Scott has remained calm and cool and collected. I know that his wife, Monica, is um, a part of that too, as, um, as all our spouses are. So I wanna thank you for your work and I wanna thank you for being here with us. We prayed for you. As they prayed for me, we have all prayed for you, and um, we are just grateful to be standing with you here today. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a little conversation, if that's okay. How was that food tonight? Come on. Well, I pray that you are encouraged. I got to tell you, I am. Wow. It's an honor to have y'all in the house tonight. And uh, all the way from Mississippi. I used to think when I was a kid, can anything good come out of Mississippi? <laughs> well, I found it. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Lynn and Scott, I think it's appropriate to say thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for your investment in the work that you do and in the things that we believe in. Uh, when we finish, can I get your autograph? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Y'all give it up for real life heroes. They really are. This is his story. So Attorney General Fitch, can you tell us a little bit about your personal story, how you decided to become an attorney and then run for the Mississippi Attorney General? Give us a little background story on that. Absolutely. But first of all, I want to say to everyone, thank you for this evening. Thank you for allowing us to be with you. What an incredible celebration that it is. I know we've come a long way, and we're going to talk about the story and how we all got together, because it's truly been a unified front. And to God be the glory. Amen. That's why we are here, and that's why it's happened. So thanks to all of you very much. Um, it has, uh, for me, been an incredible moment in time to serve, and I'm so honored to serve as the Attorney General of the State of Mississippi. And I have an amazing team, this being one of the rock stars that works for me. But I, I want to take a moment, and I just I want to say to um, my friends, my colleagues, um, Jeff and Liz, again, we have done so many things together. And that makes a huge difference. When you're in these positions and you're working with one another, you're sharing ideas, we're supporting one another. That helps us every step of every journey. And so they have been certainly great friends, but great colleagues as we've embraced a number of different issues on all of our state's uh, behalf and how we move forward. So I am so honored to serve in this capacity. Um, I, I actually worked at the Attorney General's right out of law school. That was my first job. So God had a plan that I would come back 35 years later. Now, I've been practicing law for 37 years, so I must have been 10 when I got to the AG's office. That's the best I can say. <laughs> um, but it was an incredible time for me to, to learn and to be a part of the AG's office and, and the significance and the importance of that job. And as I did a number of different things during my career, worked for Governor Barber, headed a couple of agencies and was in private practice, um, then this, I served as a state treasurer for two terms. So from the perspective of being the treasurer, then the AG was certainly my counsel. So I, I had it from both perspectives. And so then the option came to run. And it was a God thing. It was an opportunity to step up and to be a part because I knew there was service. And all of us have a public servant's heart. And so it was truly a blessing to, to make the run for the Attorney General's office. And to be there now has been an incredible. And on this journey, um, I have three beautiful children and four grandchildren. I'm still, can't believe I can say grandchildren. Oh my goodness, it's really hard. I can't believe I'm that old. Um, 
But again, so blessed. And so as we talk about this case, you know, my family is so important. And I understood the role of a single mom and the, the trials and the tribulations which helped as we got to this case. Right, right. Well, and again, I thank you. Did you ever imagine you were going to argue a case like the one that would overturn Roe? Not to this magnitude. I think many of us thought we'd never see this in our lifetime. And certainly when we had this um, opportunity given to us, we just stepped right in. We asked the hard question. Right. We wanted to post it up. Uh, we didn't want to just argue our 15-week abortion. We just saw this was a, as a true blessing to say, here's an opportunity. Understand that we're arguing this from a holistic perspective. We're arguing about empowering women and promoting life together. Right. That it no longer needed to be an either or. Um, that it was certainly wrongly decided 50 years ago, and we're all ready for the job. And so it's certainly we'll talk specifics and in, in Here's the, the person that was so strategic in the writing of our brief and arguing our case. But again, not ever thinking that we would see this. I, um, again, it's almost surreal that we're here and we get to celebrate this incredible victory that God has given to all of us. No doubt, no doubt. <laughs> Solicitor General Stewart, you clerk for Justice Clarence Thomas. What was it like to stand in front of your old, your former boss, make your opening statements? and hear him refer to you as Solicitor General Stewart. Well, first of all, uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be with you all. Uh, it's, it's an honor to serve uh, under Attorney General Fitch, and it's just been an honor to be part of this case. I, um, I've had a very lucky run in bosses in my day, um, and that certainly goes back to my time with Justice Thomas. Uh, there's something very special about being able to, to stand up, present oral argument to your former boss. I'd done it for the boss who I clerked for in Portland, this was the first time I'd ever done it before Justice Thomas. And I mean, it's both unbelievably special. There's also something that I had to kind of stifle like a smile and laughter when he referred to me as General Stewart. He's kind of like, you know, this is the only time he's ever going to refer to me as General, as General Stewart. And we're going to laugh at it over coffee or something someday. Um, but it was just, it's hard to beat. I mean, it just, I have the greatest respect for Justice Thomas. Um, He's, he's so strong, he's so courageous, he's so principled, and just to have the chance to have him ask the first questions, be able to you know, lay our case out um, right then and there was a special honor. Well, and it's odd that Justice Thomas would speak. Often he's the quiet one on the court, and yet he's got a presence that fills the room. He's kind of almost the godfather of the court, and he asked you the first question. Did that, did that surprise you? Well, one, one interesting thing in the COVID era, this is, this is a new thing, is that um, uh, when they were doing, this was an in-person argument, but when they were doing arguments over the phone, they started going justice by justice, so it wasn't kind of like justices talking over each other. So Justice Thomas, he's very polite. He's not much for interrupting people, jumping in, and you kind of have to be willing to do that in the normal kind of free-for-all. But uh, for whatever reason, when they went back in court, I think the other justices really liked Justice Thomas asking questions. He asked, he asked great questions. So I, I think the informal agreement they seem to have come to is that Justice Thomas gets to ask the first question, which I think works out great for everybody, for the court, for the advocates, for the country, and I mean, because they get to hear, like you said, his presence, um, but also just his insight, because he really pierces to the heart of the issue, and he did so in this case. Speaking of piercing to the heart of the issue, your opening statement was unparalleled in, in modern legal vernacular. Mr. Chief Justice, you wrote and spoke, May it please the court. Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey haunt our country. They have no basis in the Constitution. They have no home in our history or traditions. They damage the democratic process. They've poisoned the law. Did you tell them how you really feel? <laughs> they choked off compromise for 50 years. They've kept this court at the center of a political battle that it can never resolve. And 50 years on, they stand alone. Nowhere else does this court recognize the right to end a human life. And you conclude with, the Constitution places its trust in people. On hard issue after hard issue, the people of this country make it work. Abortion is a hard issue. It demands the best from all of us, not a judgment by a few. When an issue affects everyone, and when the Constitution does not take sides on that issue, it belongs to the people. Roe and Casey have failed, but the people if given a chance, will succeed. This court should overrule Roe and Casey and uphold the state law. I welcome the court's question. Solicitor General Scott Stewart.
Man, the hair on the back of my neck stood up when I, when I heard your statement. I thought of the prophetic voices of old that stood before tribunals at the risk of losing their lives, but spoke truth plainly, clearly, and passionately. Scott, you did that. I commend you for that. That is a powerful, powerful opportunity to be a vessel of honor. And look what it's accomplished. Now, obviously, you had to make a calculated decision. How far do we go? You went for the end zone. You went for the deep zone. Was that a calculated decision from the get-go? Talk to us about that. Sure. So I, I think, you know, as General Fitch was saying, you know, we went right out there. We went for the, the biggest possible um, argument result we hoped for. And I think fundamentally we just thought th this is the right answer. You know, I think lawyers, th this is the opening statement sort of thing. I mean, something that we really tried to do is you know, lawyers have this risk of getting trapped into legalisms, technicalities, um, minutia, but, but this case is about people's lives, and it's something that affects everyone. It's a question about, you know, this is really, I mean, General Fitch, you know, she kept emphasizing this leading up to the argument, after the argument, the day of the argument, like, this is about the people, this is a hard issue, this is something that we have to figure out ourselves as a, as a society, and taking that away from the people has been the problem, and something we really aimed for, and just our argument, the presentation, is that you know, we knew a lot of people cared about this, would be paying attention, and we wanted people to understand, hey, this is what this case is about. This is what our Constitution is about. This is what fundamentally is at stake here, and I, I think there's something magical in boldness and in standing up for the right thing in the right way, and it was very important to us to stand up for the right thing, do it in uh, firmly but gracefully, um, because the spirit you do things really affects what's going to end up happening. So we did our very best, and... and uh, we couldn't have asked for a better way for it to go. Well done. Well done. Y'all give it up one more time. <laughs> Attorney General Fitch, paint a picture for us of that day at the Capitol. Obviously, there was a lot of excitement. There was a lot of energy outside of the room. We were there with some of our legal team across the Alliance Defending Freedom and the Family Policy Networks, and our intercessory prayer team were praying, and there was a lot of activity. Talk about that day and what it was like leading up to the proceedings. It was an incredible day, as you all know. But first, I have to say to each of you, we could not have done what we did without your prayers and support. Amen. We felt the compassion, the love, the empowerment every single day as we got prepared for Scott to make the argument. As the brief was being written, everything revolved around our being uplifted by all of you. So we're so grateful for that. So thank you so very much. <laughs> I do want to say, you know, kind of leading up, you know, God puts the right team together, the right people at the right places, and certainly that happened in our regard. I mean, I have an incredible team, as I've said, but when Scott was appointed Solicitor General at the time, we didn't have the Dobbs case, but I promised him it would not be dull. And then six weeks later, we got the Dobbs case, and we were so excited. We, so his outstanding wife, Monica, to be a part of the Attorney General family, and so when I say we were all invested, an entire team, we worked on this case every single day. We had a strategy, we had a communications plan, prayer plan, everybody was involved. So as we moved through the entire process and we got ready for December the 1st, um, was just amazing. Again, we felt as we went through all the journey, all the love and all the uplifting. But when December the 1st rolled around, Scott and I walked outside we gave some opening remarks uh, there on the steps of the Capitol. And there were already several thousand people there that morning. And um, then we, we left and the rally started. And again, incredible team, everybody being so united. While we were in there, I don't know if many of you got to see the actual rally, but we had 55,000 people live stream the rally. We had a watch party in every state in the country. Amazing then thousands and thousands of people showed up to pray, to be there, to be supportive. And I have to tell you, for us, you know, it was three to one. It was a different feeling. <laughs> we had the majority. It was so impactful. The street was closed in front of the Supreme Court, and, and our supporters were filling up into the Capitol grounds. The buses rolled in. The young people were there. I mean, that was incredible for us to have the young supporters there that believed in life. We kicked off that morning's rally with Dr. Alveda King, 
it was a very emotional prayer that morning. Now, we had a lot of speakers that day, but we had 36 women speakers, very diverse. Again, all believers in the sanctity of life. We had Republicans, we had Democrats, we had Christians, we had atheists, we had doctors, lawyers, we had um, activists, we had pastors. It was an incredible emotional time filled with synergy, but all there because we felt it was important to promote life and to have that moment going on. And as we were out, uh, we were in there and Scott was making the argument again, he was so calm. I was not. He was. Um, he was extremely prepared for that moment in history. Now, Scott had been mooted eight times. Now, for those of you, that means we put him through the ringer eight times with different panels to be prepared for the argument. We had role-played every justice. He had, even as late as Monday, went through his last moot. So he was extremely prepared. And if you get a chance, please go back and listen to that historic argument. started out like that. But then to come out after the argument and see everybody there, you just felt God's presence. You just knew that good work had just occurred and that there was a tremendous light at the end of this, all in a positive way for life. So it was an emotional time but one filled with grace and excitement that God had given us. So there was a lot of energy surrounding that day. What was your impression when you stepped into the court, first impression? You know, anytime you go into the United States Supreme Court, it's very humbling. You know, you just think you are there in the chambers right there with these United States uh, justices. But we felt very good about it. The message was certainly there. We knew what our role was, um, again, but very humbling. I will say that um, it went on a lot longer. Scott had a lot of arguments that he had to post up. Um, the questions he answered brilliantly. Um, the other side um, really didn't have anything to offer except, you know, the normal fear. Um, again, the sky's going to fall. You can't overturn precedent. Um, but we were prepared, and he did a, an amazing job. I would concur on that. Scott, you mentioned the eight, or Lynn did, the eight moot courts that you did in preparation. Take us through the pre-preparation. What was it like to prepare for something so substantial? You know, for decades we've said this is not the right case, this is not the right court, this is not the right time. Obviously, y'all got past that. And now you're preparing with what you believe is the right instrument, the right moment, and a new majority. Take us through what you do to prepare going into that. Sure. So I, this is something about this case. It, it's like no other case in every way. I mean, you know, the court took this case May 17th of last year. Argument was de December 1st. That may seem like a lot of time, but we knew it wasn't. So, I mean, you go to bed thinking about this case. You wake up thinking about this case. No matter what you're doing, you're always thinking about this case. Everything that could happen that could come up during the argument. Um, Everybody has opinions about this case. Most people are glad to share all those opinions with you. So you hear, hear a lot of uh, feedback from a lot of folks, uh, which I was very grateful for. Um, you have a lot of views about, you know, is, is this the case? You know, a, a number of people said to me, you know, like, do not argue to overrule Roe and Casey. It will never happen. It will go badly. Um, this is not the case for it. You know, like, look, we heard them out. You know, we appreciated their advice, but we just, we saw it a different way. So as General Fitz said, you know, eight moots, eight practice arguments leading up, all different groups of people playing different roles, getting us ready for every possible question. Um, version of, like, we did 53 different versions of our opening brief. Um, the lawyers in the room will probably recognize that as a lot. I promise you, that is a, that is a lot. That is definitely above average. And because it just, we know how important this case is to everyone. I mean, it's, it's that important to us. We wanted to make sure we were ready for everything and that we had it uh, exactly right. So... We did that, and I, something that struck me repeatedly throughout the case is that, you know, I think we both saw this a lot, is that, you know, person after person who would see me, they would say, I'm praying for you. And you just don't see that on a normal case. Uh, you know, like, almost any, even important cases, you don't see that much. But, again, I mean, that's how important this was to people, and we could feel it, just the energy, the spirit behind what we were trying to do, and the people supporting us. Um, and there was just something magical about the whole thing, the whole day. I mean, it's a, it's a heck of a 
you know, again, May of 2021 to a decision in June of 2022. I mean, that's that's a long time to be on this sort of, uh, you know, like marathon type sprint. But it was, uh, we tried our best to do, you know, no matter what other, the, the thing I resolved, you know, the first, when the court took the case is that um, no matter what would happen, I would only do something in the case if I was convinced it was the right thing to do. You know, my view was, you know, General Fitch, you know, hired me, she hired me to exercise, you know, independent judgment. She didn't hire all of these DC attorneys or these other people who had other views on how to argue the case. And she tasked me with doing everything I could to get the right result in this case. And I felt I, you know, the right, you know, I owed it to her to do everything I could to make, you know, exercise independent judgment on these hard choices and to deal with each thing the best I could. And, you know, I did my best with that and, you know, followed her lead on how she kind of, um, presented the issue and asked for people to think about this in a different way and you know, just stuck with that and it turned out well. Kudos for being a vessel of honor. Did you ever doubt the strategy? Was there a point at which you said this is not the right way to go or we need to make an adjustment? I didn't. I, um, you know, I, I think you never go wrong standing for the right thing in the right way and um, You know, we knew we were right on the issue and on the law and that, you know, if we did everything we could, that, you know, we believe good things could happen. And it, the thing is, is that doing the right thing in the right way, it puts the right spirit behind what you're doing. It gives you, it makes possible things that the intellect cannot comprehend. So all of the very smart people that I know, I know many smart, very smart attorneys, you know, they could not imagine there being enough votes to get this result. And I'm like, you know what, like, we just see it a different way. You know, we, we believe that if we, you know, present it this way, earnestly, honestly, and gracefully, that a magical thing could happen. And we believe that the whole time and didn't waver from that. And, you know, I appreciated others, others views, but we, you know, we both did, but we stuck with what we knew to be right and didn't doubt it. Attorney General Fitch, you've repeatedly framed the message of Dobbs in these terms, empower women, and promote life. What does that mean, and what do you hope it means going forward? Well, I think it's a key message, and as we did write it and we stayed with the messaging all along, it was the first time to have a true conversation about women. And again, there wasn't need necessary to have a choice. Fifty years ago, they posted up abortion for women. If you want to succeed professionally and in your work life, then abortion was the only answer. We completely saw that differently. We wanted to argue that you can both empower and then you can also promote life, that you protect the sanctity of life, but women did not have to jeopardize their journey and no longer did you need to be steered toward abortion. Mm. And you know, in 50 years, a lot has changed. Yeah. Um, certainly the court had been hindering that. Women have moved on. Um, we've got different jobs, you look at the how the opportunities to work remotely, flexible schedules, you look at women in, in different positions. So 50 years, we had been successful, even though they tried to keep us back through the, the previous row case. So now we wanted to say to women, you and your children, you can do this, you can do this together. You don't have to lose who you are and only have an abortion as the choice. Um, and so as we've looked at that, certainly that's in, been important in, uh, after winning the case now and what do we do going forward. But I, I do want to say one thing, too, about the uplifting that we received from so many people. So in the brief, the amicus briefs, which are friends of the court brief, we, we had 76 briefs, mm -hmm. which is almost unheard of. Jeff and Liz, we are so grateful. They were right there with us on the amicus brief. Louisiana, Louisiana Family Fa Forum. I was about to say, and I'm about to say, and Louisiana Family Forum was another Amicus brief. So thank you. And I need y'all to know how critical that is because the court looked at all these briefs to go with our brief and saw that message going on on every level about empowering women and promoting life. And I think that really resonated with the justices because all those different briefs took us through the history. What had happened in 50 years, where we were, the medical advancement, 
Uh, there was even one of the amicus briefs that had a 4D sonogram. So you have to think that weighed in very heavily for the justices to see this is a different message. This is 50 years later, and we need to listen to the significance for women and their children. Excellent answer. Scott, you, and I know we know this, the Supreme Court is not an infallible court. It's reversed itself on over 200 occasions. But you had the unique opportunity to stand before this court and respectfully disagree. I believe those were the terms you used, and you did do it respectfully. And you countered perspectives, ideas, principles. We do believe that in the arena of ideas, the truth will prevail if the ambassador or the messenger can get out of the way and make certain that the main thing remains the main thing. You seem to do that very effectively. Members of the court were corrected and you've corrected past courts, not just as wrong, but egregiously wrong. Tell us how you challenge a justice or a historic precedent and still keep the trains from going off the rails. <laughs> That's a bold step. It's a risky one, too. It is, uh, you know, it, I think it goes to, you mentioned sort of not getting in your own way. And, you know, one thing that, that you know, I always sort of, you know, I think the way we sort of looked at this case in a lot is, I always try to, this, like, I never really thought of this as our case. You know, this is a case that it matters to everyone. Like, you know, so many millions of people have worked hard on this issue. And it was just kind of an honor to be able to participate in it. So I never tried to, I just said, you know, look, I am, an honor to, I am honored to be able to participate in this case. Like, I never, you know, saw it as, you know, more than that, or certainly me, me being more than that. Um, and I think... You know, I, I think, I said before, there's magic and boldness. I, I think just earnestly saying, you know, what the truth is, but not doing it in anger, mm. doing it in hope. Uh, you know, we came to the court not in anger, but in sorrow, but al and ultimately in hope. Said, look, this was a bad thing, but there's a, there's a way out. The court can solve that. The court can end it today. Um, so a hopeful message, uh, recognizing the sorrow, but just not being bitter about injustice, I think is the key way to fight injustice is just you do that well my friend <laughs> attorney general fitch this will be your final question and i'll have one more for scott what's next what do communities of faith do to cultivate a widespread respect life ethic now well it's exciting to say we're now in a post row world <laughs> how about that <laughs> So as Scott so eloquently you know, made the argument and the brief and all the support, and we ask for it to be returned to the people. And so the justices have given us that opportunity. We ask for the job, and I believe we're all ready for it. And we are positioned to work hard. We now have a number of things that we need to focus on, not only in Mississippi, but across our states. And they're very key to going back to what we made as the original argument about empowering women and promoting life. And so some of the things that we think certainly we'll be talking about in our state and then taking some action on, um, child care. Child care and making it affordable, making it um, quality child care. Um, again, empowering those children. That's going to be key to the future because the reality is they're us next, right? They're sitting in the chair. So we've got to start with these young children and have them ready through education, which starts through child care. Having the conversation and implementing workplace flexible options. Again, most young parents, they need those options. And that kind of goes hand in hand with child care. Mm. And so it's going to be important for us to implement good options because many times, you all know this, if you've looked for options for child care or if you're a working parent and you have to shift to take care of the child it's usually the mother and then ultimately we lose those mothers from the workforce so we have to keep them invested and engaged so that's going to be very important moving forward and then another very hard topic but it's a reality child support mm -hmm. enforcement of child support We've got to make that happen. The father should be equally responsible for their children. And you know why that's so important? 
they do need to be financially and economically responsible for, because far too long women have borne that, that burden. But the most important reason is if they are paying fathers, they're invested in their child's life. Okay. And that child is better off having those parents invested. And then one other topic that I think is so key for all of us is we've got to talk about how we streamline adoption and foster care. That is significant for these children moving forward and for families. We need to get these children in these families that are loving and compassionate and will help these children thrive. And right now, we all know too many children are lost in the system. And that means our system is broken. And so it is on all of us to stand up for these children. So my message is there are a lot of things that I think are certainly on our, our call to action, but those are some of the top things that I see in our state and across probably all of our states that we need to take a hard look to, again, empower these women and, and promote these children. And we're honored to work with you to accomplish that. Obviously, the law plays a role, but policy plays a role as well. And we're, we're in this for the long haul, as I believe you are. Scott, one final question for you. We were there in the June medical case. I was in the court. We were praying for Liz, we were praying for Jeff. I was there when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was frail physically, but mentally astute. And it was a very different court back then. Today we have an Alito majority, then we had a, a Ruth and Roberts apparent component that influenced the body. We weren't successful in the hospital admitting privileges, but I saw that you cited June Medical on a number of occasions in your arguments. Tell us how that facilitated your argument and your success. Sure. So, um, you know, June Medical, it was the last big case before, a uh, big abortion case that the court took before Dobbs. And, you know, it didn't get us there, you know, in the end, in, in the result. But, you know, there were some kind of gems, some things that we were able to kind of move things down the road. But one of the things that, uh, you know, frankly is most important is, we know, you know, in fighting for hard things and, you know, people in this room who, you know, are people who fight for hard things and, you know, there's a lot of, of us here right now, but when you're actually battling for these things, there aren't that many people. You know, you're usually alone or close to alone um, and you really come to appreciate and respect those who are in the battle and, you know, something that I was always grateful for, not just in that case, but in just the example they set in case after case are Attorney General Landry, Solicitor General Liz Merle, because you know, no matter how hard it is, you know, they do what, you know, what we try to do. Take a hard stand, stick with what you know is right, do it gracefully, and, you know, you can't always control the outcome, but you keep fighting because eventually, you know, you hope you're going to get there, and here, you know, it, it, this was part of a 50-year journey. Yeah. They were very much on it. They were very much leaders on it and have been tremendous leaders on it and just inspirational, huge in getting us to where we are today, and I don't know, you, it, it's hard... Uh, you know, among all the things I think I may appreciate that the most is just the leadership that they showed that so many p folks, you said, as in the courtroom elsewhere, showed to just get us to where we ended up in, in this case. So, Well, I'm honored to meet you guys. I'm honored to see your work and to see the positive effect it's had upon my state. I've prayed for this day for my entire adult life, and y'all partly made it possible, and I want to say thank you. Would you stand to your feet and give a warm Louisiana thank you to our Mississippi friends? Thank you, Jim. Come on, y'all. You can do better than that.